All right, uh, we're on our second day of our tour with uh, We Happy Few 506. And um, we're starting out our day today in the town cemetery in Burgess Garden, which has some uh, rather interesting uh, memorials and, and graves that are tied to uh, the, the World War II era. Here along the outer wall of the cemetery here in Birch's Garden, they have these uh, memorial plaques to the locals who were killed in World War II. Uh, so here's one to a pair of brothers uh, named Joseph and Lorenz. Uh, looks like Joseph was killed in November of 1942 in the Caucasus, and uh, his brother was killed about a month later in the same region. And then uh, here's another local guy uh, who was also killed the same year in the same region. Now here's another one and this is a set of four brothers who were local here who were killed during the war. Uh, so here's Hans Kurtz. He was killed in the Caucasus in, uh, no, let's see, yeah, January of 1943. Uh, his brother Franz was killed just a couple months later in Italy. Uh, Anton, looks like he was killed again later that same year in Stalino. Uh, Stalino is the name of present day Donetsk. Uh, and it looks like Sepp survived the war, but would die from his wounds in 1950. So man, here's one family that was completely wiped out by the war. Hmm. All right, now also here they have this memorial wall uh, with all of these soldiers who were just from this area. They were, they were local here uh, who were killed during the war. So at most cemeteries that you go to, you, you see a headstone and a name and, you know, the date of death, but here we can connect a name with a face. Uh, so, for example, you know, here are a couple more guys who were from Koenigsee, which is just north of here. Uh, here are some who were killed in Russia. A lot of them killed in Russia and the Caucasus. Uh, here's one by the name of Rasp, uh, who was killed in the siege of Leningrad but man you, you look at this and it, it really kind of drives home uh, just the the total cost of war now I showed this on a previous video but here's the grave of Dietrich Eckhart uh, this is the man who served as really the, the mentor for Adolf Hitler. And uh, he, some people might say, you know, why uh, should we have these memorials up? Or, or why should this man even have a marked grave? Well, I think it's important that we have these remembrances of uh, both the good and the evil in history. Uh, right now in this world, there are all kinds of crazy things going on, and uh, we're, we're seeing uh, some of the, uh, the the rhythms and the, the patterns of history repeating themselves. So it's important that we remember and learn from the bad as well as the good uh, so that we can know how to uh, properly address things in the present.
We've moved into the town square here in Birch's Garden, and if uh, if you watch the series Band of Brothers or uh, really even read some of Dick Winter's accounts, uh, it, it really makes it seem like the 101st Airborne was the first in Birch's Garden, and uh, that's not true. Uh, it, it was the the U.S. Third Infantry Division uh, that got here first. Also, the the French Second Armored uh, Division was here, but uh, right here in this square is where on May 4th the U.S. 3rd Infantry Division accepted the uh, local surrender of the Germans here in Berchtesgaden. Okay so here we are in the center of Berchtesgaden. Uh, we're in the Schlossplatz, the Palace Square, and this is where in early May 1945 the surrender of Berchtesgaden took place. You can see from this photo uh, the surrender taken place. This is the man uh, that dealt with it. It was Theodor Jakob who was the regional governor at the time and it was him, seven years post-war in 1952, uh, that actually campaigned to save the eagle's nest as well. Uh, so this is where we're staying, the Schlossplatz, that palace square, uh, the memorial in this top photo. This is for the World War I uh, memorial, obviously afterwards for World War II as well, which we can see today. We've got another kind of then and now shot here. Uh, so this is a man there on the right uh, here in the square. Uh, he's with the 81st uh, anti-aircraft unit uh, that was attached to the 101st Airborne. And if you look at that photo, well, it was taken right here in this spot. And uh, it looks like there's a, a lamp that has been, has been added now, but anyway. Yeah, some of the same markings uh, and everything are, are still here. And of course, you can see the archway uh, right here in this photo. Yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, I got some other places today that we're going to be visiting associated uh, with the, the 506th uh, Parachute Infantry Regiment and Easy Company. So we're going to hop back on the bus and. Uh, Shuffle off to the next place. We've left Birch's Garden and have moved down to a place called Zell Am Sea, which sits right over this beautiful lake. And uh, after leaving Birch's Garden, the 101st Airborne kind of set up their operations right here. Uh, Zell MC is where the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment had their regimental headquarters, a place called the Grand Hotel. There's a, a part in Band of Brothers where it shows Dick Winters, you know, diving into this lake and Lewis Nixon comes up and they have a talk. Uh, so it was, Matt Leach was saying that there's a little bit of a problem with that scene because uh, Dick Winters couldn't swim. So he would have just been like flailing about uh, in, in this lake. Uh, but anyway, I uh, got a, a couple of uh, cool stories from, from right here at this place. So again, there you can see the Grand Hotel where uh, Colonel Sink and the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment set up their headquarters during the occupation here in Austria. And I'll tell you what, for these guys who had been in combat for nearly a year uh, this this was going to be a good place to end the war uh, here on this lake the 101st airborne and the other divisions who were in this area uh, this is kind of where they would come to have big events uh, so there was a big fourth of july event here uh, they also had a big parachute drum uh, where they had this demonstration jump uh, where they actually landed right in the lake which doesn't sound safe at all uh, but anyway, uh, the guys from Easy Company, like I said, they were only here a few days and then they moved on down to Cape Rune, but they no doubt, uh, you know, came back up here because it's not too far, uh, you know, for different events and whatnot. And uh, there's one interesting story uh, of a, a guy from the, the Filthy 13 that uh, is connected with this place that, uh, that we didn't tell on our first trip here. In May of 1945, the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment moved into Zell MC and Colonel Sink set up the headquarters in the Grand Hotel. Um, some of the other 
parts of the 506, namely 2nd Battalion 506, moved on to Cape Rune, but headquarters was here, Colonel Sink was here at the Grand Hotel. And part of the regimental headquarters was um, the famous, some guys from the, a, a pretty famous unit known as the Filthy 13. And uh, you might know those guys from having the Mohawk haircuts for D-Day. Um, some of those guys moved on to become Pathfinders later on, but some of them remained with regimental headquarters. And one guy in particular told a story when he came here, and that guy is Jack Agnew, and he was one of the Filthy 13. He came back here and he told a story about commandeering a boathouse here on the lake. You know, most of the people had left. Um, when the Americans came in, they, they were fearful of what might happen. They, they were told that they, you know, they were gonna you know, be rounded up and stuff like that. So a lot of people just left. And one of the things that was left empty was this boathouse back here. And Jack Agnew told the story about going in there and starting to rent out the boats that were left behind. And you know, we have this beautiful lake here. A lot of the officers and men wanted to go out on the lake, maybe go fishing, maybe go to the other side and check it out. So uh, he made a little bit of a side business of renting commandeered boats from that boathouse to the guys that were stationed around here and um, didn't really have a lot to do during occupation duty. But a story that was passed down from Jack Agnew. We've moved on down to Cape Prune, and uh, really this is, I mean, as you can see, just one of the most picturesque places ever. Uh, just beautiful here. And this is, this is where uh, Easy Company from the Band of Brothers uh, kind of wrapped up their time uh, with, the, with the occupation uh, here in Europe. Uh, so there are a lot of stories of guys going up into the mountains and going goat hunting and, uh, and you know, things like that. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's right here at this location that one of the most famous photos of Easy Company was taken. It's been called in you know, the time since uh, the, the last formation. So anyway, uh, we're here in Cape Prune now, uh, kind of looking at, at where the, the war came to a close for the men of Easy Company. So uh, the group is over there kind of going over some things about what happened here in Cape Prune. Uh, but anyway, right here is, is about the spot where that famous photo of Easy Company was taken. As we mentioned in, in a prior video, uh, it's, it's kind of appropriate that the man who is uh, holding the guide on uh, was Brad Freeman. And uh, Brad Freeman ended up being the, the last surviving member of Easy Company. But anyway, that photo was taken right here. So we're in Cape Prune, where Easy Company did their occupation duty in the summer of 1945. And um, there was a bunch of cups made by their chalices, I guess you should say, made by the 101st Airborne. There are some large versions that the general officers got, and then there was some smaller ones that some of the division officers got. So Colonel Sink, the guy in this picture right here, who was the commander of the 506, got the idea to make his own chalice for his officers. And what he did was he got some silver that was taken out of Berchtesgaden. And um, it was, there's two stories actually. Um, one of the stories is they used coin silver and melted it down and took it to a silversmith here in Austria. The other story is that they took some of Goering's smaller cups and re-hammered them. But when you look at it, it, it says 506 parachute infantry they had a miniature parachute wings put on there, and it has the four different campaigns they were in. In this case, Normandy, Holland, Bastogne, and Germany. Now, the officers who were replacement officers who may not have been in Normandy, it'll just have whatever campaigns they participated in. This particular chalice belonged to Lieutenant Colonel Chase, who was Sink's executive officer. So this guy was second in command of the 506. And I, I recently got this from uh, Colonel Chase's daughter through historian Mark Bando, and it was put on, um, it was donated to the museum, and um, I just wanted to bring it here today since it was made here in Aus Austria from silver that was looted out of Germany and has the silversmith's um, 
mark on the bottom, but what a great piece. I've been after one of these for a long time for the museum, and um, they're really rare. Um, you, you know, you're, you would think there'd be a lot of these around, but for whatever reason, a lot of these have disappeared over the years. But it's a real honor to bring Colonel Chase's chalice back here to Austria today. Hiya, uh, Matt Leach here again. Uh, played Floyd Talbot and Band of Brothers, and JD was just asking me about the uh, the legacy and longevity of the show. Uh, we're currently on a tour to Berchtesgaden uh, with We Happy Few 506, following the steps of Easy Company, and it is, what is it, 23 years on from when we first made the show? And I'm not sure if there's a, an exact answer to this question as to why the show has such a, a great legacy. Um, everybody that you ask from the show has a sort of different answer, but I don't know. I just think it, as a show, as it just hits every touchstone. It's, it's, it's a love story. I mean, that's what Eric Jenderson called it. He sort of wrote the Bible for it. It's, it's about guys going through hell together and, and, and sticking together. It's, it's a good versus evil story. It really just is the, the, the perfect storm. Um, and I spoke a bit before um, when we were on the bus. I was, I was speaking about it that. Um, it also, it, it, it had a slow beginning when the show first aired uh, back in 2001. It actually aired September 9th, 2001, um, so two days before September 11th. So then the show kind of went underground as people didn't really have the, the stomach for that type of content. And then it got a very natural, organic groundswell of sort of people that got into it and then they got into it because then they bought the video and then they bought the DVD and then they bought the Blu-ray. Thank you all for the residuals, by the way. Uh, and then social media started, social media groups, reenactment groups. And everybody's, there's a sort of, I don't know, like a gigantic family of sort of Band of Brothers fandom that have sort of linked in and, and kept stories going. And Shane Taylor that plays Doc Rowe, he always says, and this is really, it's a really good quote, is that it's, it's an entry point into history as well. A lot of people, who've started out along the journey of getting into World War II history, started out from watching Band of Brothers. Even young historians um, have started out from watching Band of Brothers. And I think from that, a lot of them then go back to it as their sort of red earth of terror, um, their, their, their starting out point, their strength, and, and what, what got started out in history as well. So that's my opinion on it anyway. All right, well, uh, that wraps up our time here in Germany and Austria, following in the footsteps of the men of uh, Easy Company from the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Really had a lot of fun over the past few days uh, with the guys from We Happy Few 506. They have some amazing things going on. Definitely check that out. Also working with the, the Gettysburg Museum of History, doing tours like this. There, there are a lot of people who do like Band of Brothers tours. It's a pretty unique experience to be able to, to walk in the footsteps of these men, uh, kind of get insight from some of the actors uh, who, who really um, popularized their story, and then also have the artifacts from the Gettysburg Museum of History, you know, like Dick Winter's dog tags, and you know, pieces of flag from Berghoff and silver, and all those things that, that really make the experience tangible and, uh, and the history accessible. Uh, but anyway, yeah, had a lot of fun over the past few days. Uh, walking around and uh, experiencing the history. Mm -hmm.